Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Hasker. I am the very lucky person to be the new CEO at Vicksport. I've been in the role for two and a half weeks, so don't ask me any questions yet. Um, maybe give me a couple more weeks. Uh, my team will be the font of knowledge for all of us. But thank you for making the effort to trek out on a cold morning and join us for a really exciting launch of our AAA Play video that we've been working on, Big Sport, Sport and Rec and Rec Link. Um, you'll love it, it's awesome. Um, very excited to be showing it to you today. We've got some other content that we'll be going through. <coughs> Firstly, please let me um, pay my respects to and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and also pay respect to elders both past and present. For Vic Sport, um, one of our very clear strategic focuses is on inclusive sport. Um, it's an area of sport that we work very hard on with various stakeholders in the industry, so we're very proud of that work. And um, I'm very proud to be standing here welcoming you here today. And I'll now introduce you to <laughs> Tom Dixon. Tom's going to take you through and be your MC for the morning. So welcome, thank you. Um, and we'll have some time at the end to network and have some more tea and coffee and something to eat, but welcome. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so my name is Tom Dixon. I work for Big Sport, the Participation Strategy Manager. I'll be your MC for today. Um, so there's a couple of, spark, couple of parts to this morning's um, presentations. Um, one thing is we are here to talk about AAA Play, the excellent service that TrueLink operate, funded by Sport and Recreation Victoria. And um, from Big Sports' perspective, you know, I think a lot of the people in the room today we know have been working with Recklink and AAA Play, but we want to make sure that that every sport association in Victoria, including clubs and associations, are putting all the opportunities out there on that website to really make that the the central point for uh, people with disability or anyone else to to find opportunities to play sport. So. We're going to show you a video that we've developed and uh, we're going to have a panel discussion um, just talking about you know, the value of, of sport to people with disability as well as to organisations um, that, that all, all of us represent. Um, before we do that, um, we are pleased to be joined today by David Moody, who is the State Manager for <coughs> National Disability Services and um, he's going to give today's main presentation. So David, without further ado, I'll pass on to you. Thank you very much, John. Okay, can I just begin by saying just how stoked I am to actually be standing here before you today. Um, I don't say that lightly, the first time, the first time um, I ever met um, um, those two gentlemen, John Ballas and Peter from, um, from RecLink, I mean the conversation was all about the importance of expanding the, the inspiration that is RecLink to the whole of Victoria and the whole of Australia. Um, and to be in front of you today at a, you know, at a, at, if you like, the launch of the video and the expansion of RecLink's um, Web web based uh, web based products um, and them being out in the community is just fantastic from my point of view. So congratulations to to John, to Peter, to Chris, and everybody else at Recklink and AAA Play for the work that you do. Um, I just want to uh, continue by thanking Big Sport, the Victorian government, and um, of course AAA Play Recklink for inv inviting me to speak today about what I think we all agree is a really important issue and topic: what sporting associations and organisations can do to ensure that people with disability are able to access sports and recreational opportunities like everyone else in our community. <coughs> from the time we've got together this morning, I want to address myself to three key themes. How the disability services sector works and what it looks like under the NDIS. I've already had a few rather animated conversations with people about some of the challenges of actually breaking into the NDIS and, and making a go of it. The value of active living to people with disability, and I suspect in that regard I may be telling many of you had a suck eggs, but we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Mm -hmm. And how sporting organisations can partner most effectively with disability service providers to support people with disability to have a great life. One in which they have the opportunity to get into sport, into recreation, and to stay fit, or as fit as they want to be, given these are scheme based on choice and control. Okay, just a few um, definitional issues or acronyms to begin with. First of all, my organisation, National Disability Services, is not the NDIS, which is a, a common misconception. National Disability Services is the peak body nationally and in Victoria for non-government disability service providers, including RecLink. Uh, we've got about 1,100, 1,100 members nationally, organisational members nationally, and more than 200 in Victoria. 
On the other hand, the National Disability Insurance Agency, and I'll be referring a bit to the agency with a capital A, um, is of course the body responsible for administering the, the, the NDIS for oversighting and managing the scheme. And the NDIS is the NDIS, the <coughs> way of um, accessing and delivering disability services in this country. Okay, and turning to firstly what the NDIS is, and there are misconceptions about what the NDIS is and what it's supposed to do. It's not yet a social insurance scheme, it's not like WorkSafe and TAC, but that's the aspirational bit, if you will, in terms of where it needs to get to or wants to get to. It is, in fact, the biggest social policy reform initiative in Australia's history, in our view. At least, well, if not the biggest, certainly the biggest since the establishment of Medibank and then Medicare. Upon its full scheme rollout, which will be in essentially 2019-20, it will be a scheme which is funded year on year to the tune of $22 billion per annum through a combination of both Commonwealth and state funding. It basically is intended to live the ideal of early intervention in terms of supporting people with disability to get the supports they need when they need them so that they're able to optimise the outcomes they want to achieve in their lives and as a consequence further down the track potentially to be diverted or not having need to use more expensive tertiary supports as they're called. There is a focus under the scheme, as I'm sure most of you are aware, on individualised support for people with disability, and one which is about, to use the phrase I'm sure many of us have heard, choice and control, exercised and supported in its exercise by and for people with disability. Okay, so in terms of what, why we got the NDIS, I mean some of you I know would be asking yourself that question <coughs> if you try to navigate it. Um, essentially, the NDIS, in terms of its history, brief plotted history, was recommended by the Productivity Commission in its final report in 2011-12. Amongst the findings that the Productivity Commission made in examining the case for an NDIS was the fact that if in fact we continued to go as we were going with our disability and aged care systems in Australia across eight different jurisdictions, state and federal, essentially the whole thing was going to go bust by 2050 to the cost of everyone <coughs> in the community in the context of Australia having an increasingly ageing population. The Productivity Commission found that um, the uh, disability service systems across the eight jurisdictions was underfunded, inefficient and fragmented, and it wasn't working. So I recommended the establishment of the NDIS, which in its, in it working at its best, and I do not suggest it's working at its best at the moment, there are challenges, let's acknowledge them, aims to assist people with disability to achieve their goals, including greater independence, community involvement, employment and improved wellbeing. A, a scheme which working at its best is intended to take a lifetime approach so that rather than saying what do you need this week let's end that conversation here it's more about what do you need this week to support you to achieve great outcomes over your life you know that sort of conversation that's the conversation the scheme encourages and in fact expects a scheme which provides people with disability their families and carers with information and referrals to existing support services and mainstream services in our community, including, of course, sports and recreation organisations. The scheme is very different in the way that it funds disability services. It basically, in, in terms of the funding that an NDIS participant, a person who's, um, with dis who has disability and is um, funded within the scheme, um, the conversation that they have is with a, um, a planner, <coughs> The plan basically determines the outcomes and goals the person with disability wishes to achieve um, under the NDIS or through the NDIS. The plan's regularly reviewed, usually annually. It's linked to their goals. The plan is aimed to provide funding for disability sports, again, so to support the person to lead at least an ordinary life, the life that all of us would expect to lead, if not a great life. Personally, I prefer to use the word great. I think we all aspire to something more than merely ordinary. I think we can all agree with that. Um, the plan's allocated in three main categories, core capital and capacity building. And it's not a case, and I need to emphasise this for the sake of those of you, of you who might be wondering, it's not about funding, providing funding to actually satisfy anything a person with disability under the scheme wants. The specific focus on the scheme is need. And there is a subtle but important distinction between the two. I might want to fly to the moon, but I need to get to work. So I'll be funded to get to work, but not to fly to the moon, at the risk of being too simplistic about it. So that's certainly one of the parameters or caveats, if you will, on the ability of people with disability to access particular funds for particular outcomes under the scheme. Okay. Bit of innovation going, innovation, animation going on there. I might just uh, continue with it. 
should have eliminated that when I had the chance. Okay, um, it is a scheme which is very different in the way that the funding uh, is accessed by people with disability to the way it's been historically delivered. And that has implications for anyone, whether you're a participant in the scheme or, or a, a wannabe provider in the scheme or a provider already, in terms of how you engage with it. Historically, ours is a sector which essentially went to government to get funding, you know, providers would go to government to get funding to deliver particular programs of support agreed to by government and then government would then bring clients to providers to their door and then the program would be delivered to those clients. It was as simple and as difficult as that. This scheme in fact turns it all on a 180. This scheme basically puts the funding in the hands of a person with disability to purchase their supports to act, deliver outcomes under their plan. It cuts out their relationship and no longer is government the funder of disability service provision. The person with disability is the direct funder of disability service provision and therefore over time is expect, that person is expected to have significant market power in exercising that choice. And so I suppose the goal for everyone in this room is to think to yourself, how can we actually enunciate the importance of, of sport, recreation and physical activity in such a way and through whatever communication means so as to support people with disability, their families and support networks to understand the importance of what your organisations do. How can we get that message across? <laughs> okay. Um, in terms of choice and control, um, it's fair to say, and I've already alluded to this basically, um, the choice in terms of how the money is to be spent. Broadly speaking, with some qualifications, sits with a person with disability. Um, Essentially, um, I don't want to basically sort of spend too much time on technical detail. I'll be part of a panel discussion later if people have an abiding interest in the difference between core and, cap and capacity building. But suffice to say, I think it's important to note that the scheme does assume that this phrase capacity building is part of the jargon, part of the, part of the nomenclature. It's about supporting people with disability to build their capacity to do even better in their lives, both socially and economically. I mentioned before about reasonable and necessary. Um, again, to sort of kill off any, any misconceptions, essentially the concept of reasonable and necessary has been included in the scheme in order to be quite transparent in saying you don't get, it, you don't get everything and a set of steak knives just because you want it. In order to be entitled to access particular supports, you have to be able to um, demonstrate that the funding is aimed at achieving particular goals, objectives and aspirations under a person's plan, that it will increase their independence, that will increase their social and economic participation and that it will develop their capacity to actively take part in the community. I think sport, recreation and activity ticks most of those boxes already, to be quite frank, for most people in our community and therefore people with disability. Supports must be related to the participant's disability, by definition. They must represent value for money and what a value-laden term that is, but nevertheless that's what's in the, um, the NDIS Act. They must have benefit for the, to the participant and take into account informal supports by families, carers, networks and the community. As I, as I say, I think that sport, recreation and activity based um, supports certainly tick most of those boxes for many people with disability and therefore there is grounds for optimism in terms of the role that sport and recreation and activities can and will, I think, play in the lives of people with disability funded under the scheme. <coughs> So what's the, what's the big deal about the insurance model when we talk about National Disability Insurance Scheme? Here's the dirty little secret of the sector going back about 50 years. Basically, until about 2013, if you were a person with disability, you stood a very good chance of being recognised by whichever government department in whichever state you might be as having a significant disability. And therefore you were told, you've got a significant disability, so therefore you're on our radar. But the downside of that conversation would often be, hey, but by the same token, you haven't yet basically been considered disabled enough to qualify to get any supports. And this is what we call a ration system of support. One in which, one which acknowledges a person's disability, but gives them, well, next to nothing, I nearly said another phrase then, <laughs> um, uh, to, um, an acknowledgement of that support. It meant, for example, in Victoria, which is where we are now, of course, you were, you were looking at what were called euphemistically, perhaps, disability support registers, which were replete with up to 3,500 plus people just waiting to get access to disability services, which on any assessment, a properly funded system would have given them. I've certainly met people with disability under that who, who, who were 
labouring under that system who literally have languished for 10 years plus waiting for someone to give them some support so they could just basically leave their house. And we wonder why we've got the NDIS and not the state-based systems. Well, that's a big reason. I don't think that many people in our community actually appreciate just how big the NDIS is. I'm sure there are people in this room who do. But I, I mean, essentially you're talking about a scheme which on the basis of the report, um, a report released by the agency not more than 48 hours ago, it's a very recently re released report, it's currently providing $15 billion worth of supports already, and it hasn't fully rolled out, to 151,970 um, NDIS participants and counting. 21% of those participants have got a who have a plan were children aged seven to 14 years, and that's a good thing in terms of supporting the kids who will be the adults of the future to get on board and get the funding they need now to have really successful lives. 28% of participants entering in this quarter identified autism in their primary disability group, and that's it's got to be said, been the case in terms of autism being the most common of the disabilities um, in terms of the stats um, since the um, NDIS commenced. Participant satisfaction with the agency and the, and, and the planning process remains pretty consistent at about 84%. We can be cynical about that statistic perhaps in terms of our personal knowledge of the planning process, Suffice to say, that's the stat we're dealing with at the moment. There are now 14,271 approved disability service providers under the scheme. Now, I started off by trumpeting the fact that NDS is the national disability, um, the national peak body for disability service organisations, and made perhaps got passing reference to the fact we've got about 1,100 plus members. There are now 14,000 plus providers of disability services in Australia, and 52% of them are currently providing disability services. And that's because there's been, as you would probably expect, given, uh, given the way the scheme's been rolled out, a massive and exponential growth in the number of people wanting to get involved in the provision of disability services. They're allied health professionals, they're sole practitioners, they're partnerships, they're B Corps, they're social enterprises, they're um, people who are providing swimming services, they're people who are provide, providing acting services, you know, supporting people with disability to do acting and that sort of thing. Essentially, the diversity of services under this scheme has just exploded and will continue to. We heard from the uh, Chief Executive of the agency last year saying that he expected a five-fold increase in the number of disability service providers in Australia would, uh, over the journey, over the next five years. That would make it in excess of 50,000 organisations and individuals holding themselves out as capable of providing disability services. So it's massive. Um, in Victoria alone, you're talking about 105,000 people with disability moving into the scheme by the 30th of June 2019. Of those, 27,000 had never accessed disability services before. 27,000 newbies, so to speak, involved in the NDIS. So it is life-changing for thousands and thousands of Australians when it's working properly. What I love most about the scheme, and I, I must say, as you can probably tell, I, I think the scheme, for all of its faults, which are well publicised in the media at the moment, um, uh, I think the scheme, you know, once it matures, will be something we look back on with um, a great deal of positivity. I think the best thing about it is its focus on outcomes. Why is that such a big deal? It's because basically the disability service system in Australia has lived and breathed on outputs historically. So funding was provided to providers by governments to, on the basis of how many clients providers saw, how many services providers provided. Never about quality, always about quantity. This scheme basically is assessed in terms of its future viability on the basis of the outcomes that have been being achieved for and with people with disability. These are two stats from the most recent quarterly report released by the agency. And the first one in particular, I think, gives us real cause for optimism. 90% of parents or carers of children aged between 0 and 6 reported that the NDIS had helped, helped with their child's development and access to school services. Anybody who knows anything about the, the challenges faced by, people, by kids with disability and getting access to school, mainstream schools in particular, would give that a massive tick. 90% of parents were saying the, the scheme had helped them you know, broach, that, you know, broach that conversation, breach that, you know, breach that wall, if you will. Massively positive. 72% of participants aged 25 and over reported, in, reported for this quarter that the NDIS had helped them with daily living activities. And you might say, well, so they should. So, so it should provide help with daily, daily living activities. But nevertheless, what, what enthuses me about this scheme and may enthuse you is that the focus is all about outcomes. 
if you're a provider of disability services, whether you're registered or un unregistered under the scheme, it's not about <coughs> the number of clients you're seeing, it's about the quality of the outcomes you're, you're, you're actually getting for and with people with disability. It's all about the quality. Okay. So, so let's consider now the value of physical activity, sports and rec for people with disability. And everything I'm, I'm going to be talking about over the next couple of slides has a very solid research base. We know that all adults with disabilities should be doing both aerobic and muscle strengthening physical activities insofar as they possibly can. We know that in terms of aerobic activity, that moderate intensity aerobic physical activity <coughs> such as brisk walking, wheeling oneself in a wheelchair, is pretty much recommended if you can do it. Or alternatively, we know that vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity, for example, jogging, wheelchair, basketball, or a mix of both, is also highly recommended based upon research. So the, you know, the jury's in already in terms of the importance of health, sports, rep, and activity in the lives of people with disability. In terms of muscular strengthening, oh, just throwing things around here, getting too excited. Um, <coughs> We know that activities that are moderate or high intensity and, intensity and involve all major muscle groups on two, two or more days a week are highly recommended to support people with disability to, to, remain, to, keep, to get and remain fit. Working with resistance bands, adapted yoga, just to use a few examples we're aware of, and, and this is on the basis that not only do they actually provide immediate fitness benefits to a person with disability, but they provide additional health benefits as well. And for those of you who are wondering, but yes, NDIS funding does cover or support sporting and recreational pursuits on the basis that a participant, an NDIS participant, has those pursuits as part of their goals that are contained in their plan. Of course, any such pursuits need to be um, provided within the reason, reasonable and necessary framework. Quick example from Emotion 21. Some of you may be well aware of this organisation. They've been an NDS member um, or organisational associate for some time. Um, just, to, just to basically give you a practical example of how one organisation engaging with people with disability has been successful in achieving particular goals. The two goals that this organisation set for itself were to spend time, were to support people with disability, to spend time outside the home with people other than mum, dad or a carer, and to participate in group-based community, um, community, community social and recreational activities in order to develop gross motor skills and increase social participation. What lovely words, you might say. Mm -hmm. What wonderfully, you know, that's, you know, shoot for the moon, hit, shoot for the stars and hit the moon, all that sort of thing. But the fact of the matter is that what this organisation then went out and did, and I know that RecLink and AAA Play have done the same thing for La Trobe University, is not just basically drink from the Kool-Aid and say, we're doing really well. They went out and basically got RMIT University to actually measure the outcomes they were achieving for and with kids with disability. And this is what they found. And I should say that the program they're running, Beat Fit, is described as a fast-paced, energetic group fitness program designed specifically for people with Down syndrome that combines dance, aerobic movements, the rhythm of drums, and moderate, vigorous physical activity. It sounds like a lot of fun. Across the course of the research project, there was a significantly significant and important improvement in cardiovascular fitness. This was indicated by an average increase of 23% in, in terms of the quality of people's beep tests. So yeah, basically the kids involved did a beep test, and over the journey, in terms of what they're undertaking the course and then being, being tested for the purpose of the research, their improvement was almost by 25%, which is a fantastic result in any assessment. Um, and in fact, it stood in stark contrast to those who didn't complete the whole course but just spent two weeks doing it. <coughs> Parental feedback about the course was that um, they found the extra fitness benefits in their children um, meant that they had increased stamina, <coughs> greater willingness to be active, and less tiredness. Tremendously important for families and carers of kids with disability. Parents and caregivers supported beat, um, supporting BeatFit reported their children enjoyed the sessions, improved their fitness and supported, and that the sessions supported good social opportunities and new friendships. Massive ticks all around. And what we know is that when you are actually speaking to the next, if you like, the next potential intake of people in courses like this, being able to enunciate those outcomes in those terms and say on an evidence base this is what we achieved, if that's not a piece of great marketing, I don't know what is. Because what we do know is that people with disability, they're not just saying, I want a service, and their families are not saying, we just want one service. They're saying, we want a service that will deliver us, with qual deliver us quality and fantastic outcomes. And if we don't get it, we will take our funding and we will go elsewhere. Because we've got market power now and we can do that. Okay. 
I just wanted to share with you perhaps for a little bit of inspiration um, some of the innovations that we're seeing. I don't suggest all of them are, are a function of the NDIS, but I do think that they indicate where the sector is going and how those of you who want to innovate, who want to do something different, should be unabashed and trying, trying out your best new idea. The guy on the left-hand side with the prosthetic, um, yep, he's out, he's active, he's having a great time. It's also true to say that that prosthetic was made using 3D photocopying by people with disability for real wages. So if that's not a double whammy in terms of the positive, I don't know what is. The guy in the middle, he's really happy and that's because he's got his own ABN number. He runs his own video editing company and he, and, um, he also has cerebral palsy and quadriplegia. He uses his neck muscles and 21st century cutting edge apps to video edit. So he's making serious, serious dollars and um, running his own company and good on him too. This is stuff which, is anyone here from Parks Victoria? I just wanted to basically shout out to Parks Victoria and say massive kudos on behalf of the disability sector. They won an award at the end of last year um, for disability tourism, accessible tourism. Um, and it's this sort of stuff happening right here in this state, which is the reason why they won the award. Um, who would have thought that a person in a wheelchair was ever going to navigate Buckham Caves? Who would have thought that a person in a wheelchair was ever going to be get, able to get, you know, get to Hall's Gap, down the bottom here, and then come back down again? Essentially what Parks Victoria is doing, if you like, if you want an exemplar of what I'm talking about, is basically saying, we've got all this massive space, which is just fantastic, but only a portion of our community can actually get involved in it. What about the rest? So what they went out and did is basically say, well, on a return on investment basis, the disability tourism industry is worth about $8 billion to the Australian economy, <coughs> a piece of that. So let's basically, and also because it's the socially right thing to do, it should be said, but there's an economic case as well. So let's make Buck and Caves, let's make the Grampians, let's make other, other uh, parks and gardens and areas of nature that we're responsible for as accessible as possible for people with disability. And they receive national recognition for that. So. I'm just going to leave that there because it's my last slide. <laughs> Before I go, I just want to give you some food for thought. I started off... Everything's falling off this... Uh, um, I, I started off basically um, with, you know, the front page of, of the presentation was a quote. When he's out there, he's not a child with disability, he's just a kid who plays footy. Now, that came from a father who basically set up a football club called the Kulabinia Bombers Junior Football Club, Australia's first junior AFL team for kids with disability. It's a great photo, isn't it? You know, inspiration, blah, blah, blah. But it's got a dark side. The reason why he had to do it is because all the kids in that team essentially were excluded from playing with other kids in the local Auskick competition. Now, if we think that's a fair thing, if that's what basically doesn't anger us and really inspire us to do something for and with people with disability, kids with disability, <coughs> well, I'd really question our humanity. The fact of the matter is that dads and mums shouldn't have to basically go down a path of saying we'll set up our own clubs because the community wants to exclude us. They should be welcomed by sports and recreation organisations, including Auskick, and I speak, I speak as an ex-Auskick coach myself. They should be welcomed and, and, and mainstream services, sporting organisations should be supported to actually get with the program, make their activities accessible and understand that we are a whole community, whether we do or don't have a disability. So I want to say to everyone, let's work together to make it happen. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, David. Yeah. Um, what we're going to now, David, I'll ask you to actually jump straight up to the panel. We're going to have a, a quick discussion with David and a few other special guests today. So we've got Danny Lawson, Project Leader for Inclusion at Tennis Victoria. Uh, Chris Lacey, State Manager at RecLink Australia. And we've got Emma Remington and Sunny Remington, who star in our AAA Play video. So we're going to get them up onto the uh, stage as well. Um, I'm just going to switch on the microphone for these guests.
Now we're going to keep this fairly short and sharp. We will have half an hour um, after the formal leaves and all these people will be sitting around. So we won't do questions from the audience uh, during the discussion, but everyone will be around afterwards for another cup of coffee and uh, to have a chat. Um, but Chris, I might start with you. Um, and I'm going to throw a question I didn't actually send to you before. <laughs> what, what would you like to see in, in another five, ten years' time? Or what, if we have this event in another five years, what do you want us to be talking about? Thanks, Tom, and thanks everyone for taking the opportunity from behalf of Reckonk Australia. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And it's great to have Sport with Victoria, a huge sport as a triple A play. Um, Tim and uh, Rachel here, so thank you everyone um, for being here and thanks um, Dave for your words this morning. Um, well I think uh, we want more inclusive sport and, um, and we want more people participating in sport across the board and I think um, you know David's vision at the end there we we want um, you know everyone to be able to participate in, in all forms of sport at all times and, and not to have as much as possible not to have a distinction um, between different types of sport. Um, at Reckonk Australia, um, all of our programs are inclusive uh, for everyone, apart from a, a few that are for women only, and that's um, particularly to, for supporting vulnerable women. Uh, but all of our programs, and for the third years that we've been running, I'm, I'm proud to say, have uh, been open to people of all genders, all abilities, and, and all ages. Um, and, uh, and that's been, um, at times, challenging, but has really added to um, what's made Reckonk vibrant and um, has made us and helped us to um, connect with as many people in the community as we possibly can. And so hopefully in five years, um, we're, we're all doing the same thing. And you've done some great work in demonstrating the value of some of your programs. Do you want to touch on that research you did with the Trove University around the um, social return on investment for your football programs? Yes, thanks. Um, so we worked with La Trobe University in the, for our 2016 season uh, with our, all our structured sports programs. We run leagues right across Australia in, um, in 11 different sports. Um, and we work within 31 different types of sport recreation um, programs uh, or activities across Australia as well. So we worked with La Trobe um, Centre for Sport and Social Impact and they had three um, professorial fellows work with us for the course of that season um, and talk to all of our players or a bunch of our players and our um, volunteers and our coaches and our agencies. And they found that there was a whole range of different um, outcomes that we were getting um, through our program. And some of those were um, pretty well understood and we, we, un we knew that were there. So things like physical health, um, social inclusion, um, you know, so reduction in, in issues around mental health, um, you know, all those kinds of great things that people get out of sport anyway, but also found that we're getting outcomes around helping people find work and jobs, uh, reducing crime, and a whole range of other things as well. Um, and it found for every dollar that was invested into the program, um, it returned $8.94 of social value to the community. Um, and that really came from, a, uh, from us, you know, our model, really upscaled that investment as well. So that came from a, initially a $30,000 grant um, from um, Sport Rec Victoria, which we turned into $400,000 worth of inputs in terms of different volunteers and agency involvement, which was turned in, then into um, around $4 million worth of outcomes. Cool, fantastic, thanks Chris. Um, we'll move on to you, Emma, if you want to pass the mic along. Emma, now yourself and your son, Sunny, star in our um, video. So we thank you very much for doing that and for being here today. Um, just to quickly just touch on, I guess, the impact that sport has had on um, all of your lives as a family. Okay, so um, Sunny was playing a lot of sports um, from a very young age. Um, before his diagnosis, um, he has Perthes disease. So he, um, he was doing tennis lessons um, a few months before he was diagnosed and went into the wheelchair and he loved it and um, had a very natural skill and basketball too. So <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so when um, he was diagnosed we were really concerned about how he would carry on playing sport um, and which is his absolute favourite. He's just stuck me again. Um, <laughs> And um, so to be able to find a coach, a tennis coach, 
um, through AAA um, and get him back onto the court and then also to then get to Melbourne Park and play there and just see how happy it makes him. Um, it's just been amazing and he's, he's just learned so much. And it's also grown his um, confidence and he's got his Australian open ball, which you can say about that, it's funny. Um, so he's just, um, it's grown his confidence Um, and uh, it's obviously given him so much exercise too, which is, is really, really good. Uh, <laughs> um, and well, he, he plays in a wheelchair basketball team as well, and so as a family, we all go to that pretty much every weekend. And um, his sister, Evie Rose, she also gets in a wheelchair. She plays in the team sometimes. And Neil, my husband, he helps. Yes, yeah, she is. Really good. And so for us as a family, it's something we can do all together. Plus, it introduces us to other families that are going through similar situations. Uh, they're all ages. And it's just so wonderful. It's such a good community. And we've actually then ended up bumping into them at other things too. We see them sometimes at Melbourne Park and they've just got such a wonderful relationship all together. So for all of us, it's just made a huge difference to our lives as a family. Yeah, fantastic. Now, Sunny, so you brought in your Wired Australian Open tennis ball. Who did you get <coughs> to, to sign that? Uh, uh, I got Heath and Dylan and Alan Calabin, they signed it at Australian Open and we actually got to meet Dylan and Heath at, when, at a practice course and it's just just so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and who's your favourite player? Is it Dylan or Heath? Both of them. They're yeah. just so good. They, Dylan won actually a um, grand finals of a um, wheelchair tennis at Australian Open and we go and we go to see it and and I play for a wheelchair basketball team um called the Wheelies and we go so fast and my and my mum you know my mum says Evie joins in and my dad does and mum never has but <laughs> a professional tennis player and professional basketball player? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Good on you, mate. Um, would you mind passing the microphone over to Danny? <laughs> Danny, um, so you're Tennis Victoria, the project lead for inclusion there. We know tennis do some fantastic work in the inclusion space. Um, what's some of the work you're doing with tennis clubs and um, how do you think they're sort of going in terms of um, being more inclusive of everyone in the community? Yeah, I think our um, tennis clubs and, and coaches, uh, probably more in recent years, have become a lot more aware of their local population and their need to reflect that local population, which means being inclusive. Um, they also recognise now that it actually takes action, um, which I think is a big step for, for some of our committees who have been in place for a long time to recognise that it's not just you know the simple saying of, yeah, anyone can come play here, it's actually taking the action to make sure that they can, um, whether it's yeah, removing those barriers or, or um, language issues or whatever it is, um, that they recognise that it takes action. So um, we've got a lot of great clubs and coaches who are doing fantastic work in their local community. Um, a lot of the time that's through partnering with um, disability service providers um, to uh, whether it's, um, we're fortunate in tennis, I think that it's a sport that anyone can play, even if it's across all ages and things like that. Um, like, you know, there's my, my kids have a hit with my, um, my father. Um, so it's cross-generational and there's no reason that, you know, Sonny can't have a hit with his mum, which I think makes um, tennis pretty unique and special. But 
um, what I was going back to is um, our clubs have worked uh, along with us quite closely with um, service providers to co-design programs that will suit as well. So for example, um, we've done a bit of work with Scope where it's taking the basis of our Hot Shots program and just making sure that that is really enjoyable for the target market. Um, for whoever's on court, which I think you do as a coach in lessons anyway, make sure it's enjoyable for, for whoever's playing. So it might be um, making it more game space and a bit of fun, some more regressions and progressions and things as necessary. So that seems to be working really well um, for a lot of our clubs and we're um, yeah, seeing some great results out of that. Yeah, fantastic. And, and have you seen, I guess, an increase in participation across the board as well? Um, yeah, we have. It's something that I think is um, can be quite difficult to measure sometimes because a lot of what we're trying to do and emphasise as well is about having um, choice, which you alluded to before as well. So, um, for example, uh, we've got one club that does a lot of great work um, and is linked with a school for uh, kids who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, now she's run like taster sessions and um, sessions that are specifically, and the coaches have gone through Auslan training and things, but um, she's run sessions that are specifically for the kids who are deaf and hard of hearing, but it's also about affording the choice um, that some of the kids now are progressing through to their, um, I guess, uh, Saturday association competition as well. So it's about affording choice if they want to play uh, simply in their environment or if they want to um, yeah, basically play however they want, whether it's higher accord or have a coaching lesson or, or whatever it is. So it's sort of hard to measure. Um, we've seen a lot more increase in our, I think, in our partnerships, which reflects that we've got a higher participation in that area. But yeah, it is something hard to, that is a bit difficult to measure when you're trying to make the sport fully inclusive and that means playing however, wherever. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Danny. Um, final question to you, David. Um, thanks for that presentation, it was fantastic and good to hear more about uh, the NDIS. I guess one of the questions that the sport industry had ever since NDIS was created was, um, you know, how do we ensure that sport and recreation is perhaps top of mind, not just for, for the people that are receiving support, but also the people helping people do the plans, because um, you know, there's obviously a whole range of activities that people want to do, and, they may not want to engage in sport, but what's your advice to people in the room around how as an industry we can work to make sure that, that physical activity is really a top priority for people coming through that program? I would recommend, it's a good question actually in terms of how you actually promote the virtues of what you're doing and the fact that you even exist. I would recommend that you speak with your local NDIA regional office. Um, in, uh, they have regional offices in the north, the east and the west um, of Melbourne um, to actually just enlighten them to the fact that uh, you, you do exist and you are holding yourself out as being capable of providing um, sport and recreation opportunities to people with disability. I'd also recommend you um, speak to what's called a local area coordinator in each of those in, in, in each of those areas. There are the LACs, as they're called in the sector, uh, doing the great bulk of the planning with NDIS participants. One of our critiques of the planning process is that the planners... Well, how do I put this nicely? Um, many of the planners um, don't have as good an understanding of um, disability as perhaps we would like, and that's not their fault. It's what happens when you actually onboard thousands and thousands of people in order to do planning for 475,000 Australians. And with the speed that the scheme's been rolled out, there often hasn't been the time to appropriately um, train those planners to do the job as well as they, I've got no doubt they will eventually. So at the moment, you just need to get in the face of the NDIA at a local level, the local area coordinators at a local level, and they're their, their contact details are on the NDIS's website at www.ndis.gov.au um, and uh, on a, an even more local level, the micro level if you like, um, do as Tennis Australia and others apparently are doing and, in, and identify <coughs> disability service providers who um, you're confident um, you can work with and who, if, if you like, are providing supports to a particular constituency within the disability sector because disability isn't generic, it's not homogenous, so I mean, there are all types of disabilities, um, and approach them directly. Scope is one of our um, longest members. It used to be called the Spastic Society in Victoria, um, and, but Scope Australia um, uh, is a, a statewide provider of disability services, and there are other um, statewide and nationwide providers, but there are also a lot of local providers. We'll only be too glad to hear from you if you're often offering them the opportunity to partner on community activities. Because the other thing is, 
Ours is a sector which is moving out of the centres, moving out of bricks and mortar to support people with disability to be in their community. So it's about supporting people to get out of the house, get out of the centres, and that's another reason why I think the work that the organisations in this room do so, is so well aligned with the NDIS. Cool, fantastic. Thanks, David. Um, as to earlier, look, I would ask many more questions myself with the panel. I'm sure you would too. We'll, we'll have them all around after formalities conclude and there'll be tea and coffee still available. Um, but for now, so have you got one more? I think Sonny's got one. Sonny's got another point, of course. Of course. Um, I got Heath's tennis racket. <laughs> and when we were at um, at grand finals with Dylan, he came over and we had a little chat to say good hello and he gave it to me for a present because I think he said to me he's getting six new tennis rackets <laughs> <laughs> Why? But I just wanted to say this, this is the most important thing. People that don't play sport, they can still have a try. If they don't know, then they can have lessons or people that can play sport can and the people that can play sport can teach them. That's it for all of us. Well done, Sunny. And a big round of applause to our panel this morning. Thank you very much.